meningitis is the topic and in this video what we really will discuss is the acute form of meningitis and the bacterial form because meningitis has quite a few different types and what we're really talking about with meningitis is an infection of the meninges and what I'll do is I'll draw a very basic diagram showing the layers and that will give you an idea of what we're talking about so first of course in the skull you have the cranium and right below it you have the first layer of the meninges which is known as the dura mater and you have a little space on, underneath and then below that you have the second layer of the meninges which is the arachnoid matter and then you have a space underneath that and then you have the third and final layer which is the pia matter and then right below the pia matter is of course the brain and these uh, three layers are known as the meninges and there's a space beneath the arachnoid matter right here which is very important it's known as the subarachnoid space and the subarachnoid space is where the cerebrospinal fluid lies CSF cerebro spinal fluid and this fluid is really important in the diagnosis of meningitis because it can be analyzed and tell you a lot of important uh, diagnostic clues including what type of bacteria is infecting the patient so infection of the meninges because the bacteria reaches these meninges and the subarachnoid space so what is the etiology of meningitis? There's a long list of uh, bacteria, but there's two in particular that I wanted to mention that are very commonly tested. The first is Neisseria meningitidis, and the second one is Strep pneumo. Another thing I wanted to talk about with etiology is the root that a person can be infected through. The most common is through the bloodstream. The next is through the sinuses. And the third is some sort of wound or surgical procedure that can result in meningitis. The next, next thing with regard to etiology is the immune status of the patient. Immune status or immunocompromised status can be a great um, concern because it can cause meningitis in certain patients. And there's a few bugs that I really wanted to mention. The first one is known as Listeria monocytogenes. The next one is Pseudomonas. And then there's a third one called Mycobacterium. And these bugs can be the causative bacteria in uh, patients that are immunocompromised. So now let's talk about the symptoms of meningitis. Well, like a lot of medical conditions, there's a lot of nonspecific symptoms, unfortunately, such as malaise and uh, fever. Uh, vomiting can occur with the patient with meningitis. Headache, of course, a big one irritability but fortunately there's some very specific symptoms and diagnostic uh, clues the first one is photophobia the next one is nuchal rigidity and what we're talking really about is neck pain and there's two physical exam maneuvers that you can do that are very important uh, in the diagnostic uh, workup of meningitis. They're known as Koenig's and Brzezinski's signs. Basically Koenig's sign is what you do is you extend the leg at the knee and this will cause pain and that will essentially will prevent you from fully extending the leg. The Brzezinski sign is what you do is you flex the patient's neck 
And what that does is it causes the patient to automatically flex his or her legs. So these are two very important physical exam maneuvers in the diagnostic workup of meningitis. One thing I wanted to mention before I get into the lab tests is papilledema. If a patient has papilledema, this is a telltale sign of increased intracranial pressure, increased ICP, intracranial pressure. And intracranial pressure being increased or there being a mass of some sort is very uh, important to distinguish because if that's the case, then that will guide you to a different diagnostic test. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later because normally in meningitis you do a lumbar puncture, but if the patient has either of these two, a lumbar puncture should not be done. You should do a CT of the head. So keep that in mind if you see that on a clinical vignette. Well, now let's talk about the diagnosis. Well, there's a certain order that they recommend, and it makes perfect sense once you think about it. The first thing, of course, is you want to draw the blood to send for a blood culture. And you want to do that before you give antibiotics. Because if you gave the antibiotics initially, then they might kill the bacteria, then the blood culture would be negative. And in particular, antibiotics are given if the patient is very ill. And then you move forward with your more invasive or expensive diagnostic tests. The very first thing you should do is if you suspect any type of increased intracranial pressure or mass, then you should do a CT. If there is no uh, suspicion of a mass or intracranial pressure being increased, then you would proceed with the lumbar puncture. And the lumbar puncture is a very important test. It tells you a lot. With the lumbar puncture, you can obtain a sample of the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, and that can be analyzed, and it will give you a lot of very important clues. CSF analysis includes a lot of things. For example, the WBC count, that will be elevated in meningitis. Protein count, that will be elevated. Glucose will be low because the bacteria are eating the glucose. And then, of course, a gram stain and the culture are important because it helps identify which bacteria is causing the meningitis. And then finally, treatment. Antibiotics, of course, most commonly IV, ceftriaxone, very commonly used. Another antibiotic that's commonly used is vancomycin, a very strong antibiotic given IV. Clinical vignettes. 25-year-old male graduate student develops acute headache, fever, and rash while visiting his parents during fall break. When he comes to the emergency department, he has a widespread petechial rash and stiff neck, blood pressure 78. He is treated with appropriate empiric antibiotics, and a spinal fluid from a tap reveals a large number of polynuclear leukocytes and gram-negative diplococci. What is the most likely diagnosis? This is a nice classic clinical vignette that is describing a patient with meningitis. Next one, 41-year-old woman who has flu-like symptoms last week comes to the emergency department because of a 48-hour history of tongue numbness and a bit of tingling in her fingertips. A few hours ago, she had had trouble moving her mouth and difficulty swallowing because water would drool out of her mouth. She also states that her eyes feel like they were when they were dilated. She tells you that she has had some neck ache and back ache, pain in her eyes with movement, temperatures 101, Examination shows bilateral lower motor neuron seventh nerve palsy, absent gag bilaterally, slow and weak tongue movement, and decreased taste bilaterally. She complains of pain and attempts to resist motion when you try to flex her neck as she is lying on her back, and when you flex her left leg at the hip and try to straighten her knee. 
routine lab studies in the CT of the scan are normal, most appropriate next step is? Very good question. They describe the Koenig's and Brzezinski's maneuvers in here, in this question. Right in here, when they're trying to flex her neck and trying to flex her left leg. Basically, they want you to uh, proceed with the diagnostic workup. And there's nothing in the clinical vignette to suggest that she has a mass or increased intracranial pressure. So it's safe to proceed with a lumbar puncture. And with this, you can get the cerebrospinal fluid and see if she indeed has a meningitis. And then finally, a 36-year-old woman comes to the emergency department with severe headache. She states that the headache woke her up from sleep six hours ago and was not relieved by aspirin or acetaminophen. She also noticed that she has neck stiffness and that it hurts during neck extension and flexion. She was recently diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, but before that she was usually pretty healthy except for a few urinary tract infections and hypertension. Temperature is 102, blood pressure is 130, pulse is 75, and respirations are 17. Physical exam shows nuchal rigidity. Fundoscopic exam shows bilateral optic disc swelling. She appears lethargic, has eye tenderness with movement, and mild photosensitivity. After blood cultures are obtained, the most appropriate next step is... Well, this question is a very good one. This patient is quite ill. She severe headache, pretty good fever, a lot of physical exam findings. But this one is a very telltale sign. This makes me think that she has increased intracranial pressure or some sort of a mass. But we don't know that for sure. We definitely know that we shouldn't do the lumbar puncture immediately we should do a CT first. And then if the CT shows that there's no mass or cause for intracranial pressure being increased, then we can do a lumbar puncture. But before we do any of that, we should immediately, in this patient, because she is quite ill, start IV antibiotics. And then once those are started, you can proceed with the CT of the head. That would be the correct order in which you would proceed.